This is Epicenter, episode 377 with guest Harsh Rajat. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, well, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe to get episodes every week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guest is Harsh Rajat. He's the project lead and founder of Ethereum Push Notification Service. EPNS is an infrastructure project which builds a decentralized push notification service. So basically, it allows smart contracts to send notifications to account addresses, and there's lots of applications for this. So in a DEX context, a user could be notified when the price of a token falls or rises by a certain percentage. You could also set up a notification for when a trade is executed or completed. In DeFi, a lending protocol user could set up a notification and be informed when they're about to be liquidated. LP providers could set up a notification about impermanent loss and things like that. And there's other applications in gaming and NFTs, which we go into during the interview. So one thing I learned during this interview is that push notifications as we know them in our everyday lives, like the ones that we get on our phones, for example, are highly reliant on mobile dev platforms. So in iOS, for example, all the push notifications go through Apple before being delivered to your phone. EPNS provides an alternative for this that is decentralized and censorship resistant. And the nice thing about EPNS is that it's not blockchain specific. Off-chain applications can also use EPNS to send notifications to their users. Sunny and I went into this interview really excited about the tech and all its potential applications because we think that the idea of a dApp or a smart contract sending notifications to wallet addresses is really cool and useful. During the interview, though, we realized that there was one thing about EPNS that we missed during our research somehow, and that is that it also includes this incentive mechanism that allows users to be paid to receive messages. So the idea is that people would sign up to a channel and they could be paid to receive messages from, say, like a project, for example. We didn't really understand why this was useful in the broader kind of context of the project. And we felt that it could create opportunities for some spammy behavior. So there's part of the interview where we address that with Harsh. In any case, I'm really excited about this project and the technology. They have a really great team. They have a wealth of experience in the mobile app space, and they're backed by some prominent figures in the ecosystem. So I have no doubt that they have the resources and the ability to succeed at building something which is really valuable. The next time you need to make a swap, don't worry about figuring out which DEX or AMM will provide you the best price. Just go to One Inch. It's my go-to DEX aggregator. And when I use One Inch, I know I'm getting the best price for my trade. What's nice about One Inch is that it allows you to choose on maximum return or lowest gas cost when you're making a trade then you can choose which one is right for you. To learn more about 1inch and start using it today, go to epicenter.rocks slash 1inch. And with that, here's our interview with Harsh Rajat. We're here with Harsh Rajat. He is the project lead and co-founder of Ethereum Push Notification Service. And it's a protocol uh, that allows for anyone to send notifications on a blockchain so contrary to like other notification service that uh, I think most people are used to, uh, these go through like typically like a central server and Ethereum push notification service actually is uh, living on a blockchain. So it, it uses the uh, underlying uh, infrastructure of, of, of Ethereum to, um, to push notifications to users. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, excited to be here. So tell us a bit about your background and how you became involved in crypto. Sure. Uh, my background, uh, I've been a mobile entrepreneur from 2010. So started my entrepreneurship journey quite early. Was there uh, in the mobile ecosystem space, designed a lot of apps and games. Uh, some of them were quite popular as well. But yeah, in 2015, I kind of grew bored of uh, the ecosystem and just uh, developing mobile apps and games. 
And that was when the exploratory phase started. Around two, uh, 2016, I entered into trading as well. But yeah, I was uh, at that point of time, I was going through a lot of tech. Uh, I was trying to also dabble into marketing. I was also exploring a lot of other uh, technologies, including machine learning and AI and software as a service product. But yeah, in 2018, uh, I realized that you can program on Ethereum or uh, you can program on Solidity, uh, which is a weird curve because, you know, I was trading. Uh, uh, from 2016 onwards with a classic strategy of uh, buying high and selling low. But yeah, uh, in 2018, I found out that, you know, you can program on solidity. And uh, I always believe that before, you know, uh, you can start solving some problem, you have to learn about it, right? So uh, at that point of time, I joined a fintech startup. Uh, they were doing a P2P meta transaction uh, smart contract as well as a mobile app, was there for around uh, one and a half years, learned uh, about smart contracts, learned about the ecosystem. And yeah, that led me to start uh, Ethereum push notification service in 2020. So before before you uh, actually got to like start Ethereum push notification service, were you what, like what kind of things were you building with solidity like what kind of things were you building in that like sort of like your learning journey in the ethereum space sure so i dabbled into i mean we all start with hello world in the smart contract so yeah uh, that was the first part but yeah i moved into and i uh dabbled into uh trying to create a version of google drive for uh, the previous form uh, which would, uh, instead of Google Drive, which will be storing uh, files uh, on the Ethereum ecosystem, of course, with, with IPFS and Ethereum ecosystem playing in tandem. And, you know, essentially that came in handy with notifications as well, because, you know, while you can store everything on Ethereum, but that will be very expensive. So IPFS really opens up a whole lot of possibility. So, yeah, in uh, the previous tenure, uh, I played around uh, with meta transaction played around uh, with how you can create a, basically a Google Drive version uh, on the Ethereum ecosystem using IPFS and of course the Hello World contract. So it seems you've always been very more attracted to sort of the Web3 aspects of the uh, ecosystem more so than, for example, DeFi or any of these other like narratives. So what, what attracts you so much to the uh, Web3 vision? The first thing uh, about Web3 is uh, that, and you know, I believe in the future. So, you know, the basic thing which really excites me is that uh, in a way, your public wallet address is your username and your private key is your password. And that essentially fits into any service. And when you move from that service, you are essentially carrying your data. So, it's kind of like a very new thing uh, to have, or it was a new thing to have when I started, but that uh, excited me because uh, you know, all, uh, a lot of times I, I was thinking that, you know, why can't my data move between servers and who should own my data, whether it should be me or whether it should be corporations. And, you know, Web3 sort of enabled that. Uh, so apart from, you know, of course, uh, it's censorship resistant, uh, it's better, you know, in terms of privacy. But, you know, taking that apart, it also enables you to move your data and in a way control your data, which was not really, or which is still not present in Web2. So how did you end up uh, coming now to the uh, push notifications? Like, you know, with all these, you know, sub-verticals you could dive into within Web3, push notifications often isn't, the f people think about storage or like, you know, messaging, but like, how did you end up on push notifications? Sure. So actually, it's a full circle for me. When I started in 2010, I started as a mobile entrepreneur, right? And uh, I uh, we created a web browser at that point of time that used to compete with uh, Safari and Google Chrome. And uh, uh, what we realized, uh, I mean, we were lucky. We, uh, the app was quite popular. At that point of time, it had tabs, download manager, all the fancy bells and whistles. And because of that, you know, whenever a new tech was coming, we were rushing to incorporate it. 
and uh, around that point of time you know apple launched push notification and i was uh, able to deep dive into their architecture and understand you know why that communication middleware was needed and what sort of avenues it opened up and yeah because of that i was a huge fan of push notifications from uh, there on and if you can see uh, basically from 2010 uh, those notifications they basically transformed our lives so we don't realize it but right now we are dependent on these push notifications so much in the web to world i mean this meeting uh, would have probably been a push notification any emails any payments uh, any social likes or any trends which you visit or services you visit uh, traditionally the services these traditional services they essentially send you a notification telling you that you know your attention is needed even you know your whatsapp uh, uh, video calls or your whatsapp chats or your facetime calls are push notifications which are then transformed based on the payload in essence i already knew about push notifications and you know when in 2020 we uh, sat down and we started uh, uh, going through uh, observing a lot of taps and smart contracts to see if there was any pain point we were comparing it with the web2 experience and what happened was we quickly realized that uh, while web2 services they come back to the user and they say hey we need your attention what do you want to do do you want to pick up this call you are trending do you want to go and reply uh, when you compare it with the uh, the web3 world uh, the services are still uh, in the stone age era of communication uh, where then you know web3 services expect users to come back to them uh, like you know you take a loan on ave it can be liquidated uh, without you getting to know about it unless you are going back to those services and checking that out uh, any governance what happens you know uh, you will not know about it unless you go back and check it out take for example any dexes or you know ens domain uh, names they expire and the user is expected to keep track of it and while that's okay when you start early but as we mature and we grow a lot you know it becomes quite tough if you are uh, uh, dabbling in 20 different web3 services you need that same sort of interface which web2 has already perfected and you know uh, they have already proven that the the user engagement and retention is more when you are doing push notifications so yeah because i had that knowledge and because we were observing these points we quickly noticed that this is something which uh, is probably we can uh, help build and you know of course we were lucky and at the right place at the right time to do that one inch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top dexes and amms to save you money and time on swaps one inch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths i started using one inch last summer and since then it's become my go to aggregator i use it every time i need to make a swap They recently launched V2 which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm and my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use one inch. And you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks/1inch. That's one I N C H. We'd like to thank One Inch for their support of the podcast. You said something that uh, I, I think is really interesting as you were talking about like these different services like needing your attention. And I mean, personally, in the last probably in the last year or two, like I've been really on this kind of like this quest to regain control of my attention, and so I've. gotten off of a lot of social media and in, in fact I barely get any notifications on my phone at all like even WhatsApp messages like don't have me- I don't have notifications turned on for that and I wonder if in this journey of yours to you know provide something that I think like is of actual value right it's like providing people with the information they need when they need it if you also have given any thought to I mean I I don't want to say like the consequences because it's you know, like you're not the <laughs> the root of the problem i think the root of the problem is more just like our digital lives that have taken over our attentions but if you have given any thought to like design mechanisms that or design patterns that are 
a little bit more mindful of our of our limited attention if that's something that you've either incorporated in the, in the product or have given some thought to sure actually we did you know because uh, we we actually believe a lot in uh, basically observing so for example you know telegram uh, messages stay at a boon but at one point of time if you go on telegram you are getting loads and loads of spam because no one stops uh, uh, the other user to send you a message and uh, you know that kind of became a thesis that before we start building a notification protocol we need to make sure that you know the users who are going to receive these notifications uh, they should always be in control and you know of course uh, the services that will send notifications so uh, they are also given a mechanism by which uh, if they are abusing the service they are throttled down not by us not by our, a centralized entity but in a decentralized way through the protocol itself so the way we developed this protocol was uh, by always ensuring that the user is always in in control and uh, the way we do it is that whenever the service wants to send a notification to a user wallet whether it's a dapp whether it's a smart contract whether it's a traditional server uh before they are able to do that the user has to opt in to receive these notifications because you know in the end uh, that's how the design system should be a user shouldn't get anything which they don't want and uh, that is the first uh, design step we took that notifications are cool it might uh, be game changing for the entire ecosystem but they also have this uh, evil attached to them where then anybody will come and you know they will just start spamming and how can we stop that and we realized that the best way to stop it is to make sure that the user is in full control of receiving or enabling these notifications from a service or disabling it from a service and after that the service cannot usually send the notifications out so that was the first step the second step we did was a, a civil mechanism or a protection which was based on the thesis that what if a service is pro- uh, performing really well and they get loads of users and after that they turn evil or they are bought out or they are uh, hijacked for that you know uh, we developed something called a spam score and we developed uh, or we are still developing uh, a governance which will make sure that you know if a service is uh, not performing or you know if a service is performing in suspicious ways then uh, the protocol or that smart contract middleware which we are designing it's essentially is able to throttle notification from the service and give them a chance to basically correct that behavior and you know if they don't stop uh, the throttling will start to go up and up and again that's based on all the automatic controls all the positive and negative action the service takes in regards to sending notification and regards to their channel uh but yeah those were the two points uh, which we thought about i would be happy to get more into the spam score throttle well let's come back to that actually first let's can you maybe tell us about how the protocol works and like what what does it even mean to be a decentralized notification protocol cuz like you know in apple's ios toolkit or whatever like some server has to be the one saying to send the push notification. So what does it mean to have a decentralized push notification service? To understand that uh, I mean let's take a step back and uh, let's talk about the Apple push notification service and how they usually operate. So yeah, uh, basically uh, the way Apple notification middleware is made, it's made I mean yeah, so basically there's a Apple middleware that handles Apple push notification service. and whoever are the app owners they basically have to interact with this middleware and not many people realize that this middleware is basically responsible for a lot of things but uh, certain uh, core things which this middleware does is a it verifies if the app owner is entitled to send notification on the app's behalf uh, b it ensures that the user has opted in to receive these notifications and see this uh, middleware this apple middleware 
ensures that you know if an app is sending a lot of notifications, then it's throttled. Uh, now, you know, if all those rules are met, notifications, they basically em are emitted out from this middleware. And then what Apple ecosystem and what Apple platforms are doing is they, ha they have a socket or a WSS connection to this middleware and they are only listening to this middleware and they are then showing notifications to their operating system. And while, you know, it seems quite easy, but uh, it's quite complex uh, if you look about it in the architecture way. I mean, if there was uh, if there was no middleware, then Apple was instead going for hey, I will just listen to WhatsApp middleware or Facebook middleware and show notification. First of all, it will become quite tedious because now yeah, Apple as an ecosystem is listening to hundred middlewares, and you know they are trying to see and uh, uh, put hundreds of notifications from those hundred middlewares, which is not possible because, you know, the battery will be gone in like five minutes. So it's a quite elegant solution that you have one middleware which standardizes all the flow and imposes the rules. And then the ecosystem listens to it and shows all these notifications. So yeah, that's, that's Apple push notification uh, service. What we did was we essentially took this decentralized middleware and we transformed it to the Web3 uh, architecture layer. So for instance, uh, one, one of the things we did with the middleware, of course, you know, all these rules, we took that, we borrowed that, and we cooked it in the decentralized smart contract of ours to create a Web3 standard of communication and notifications. But yeah, with Apple ecosystem, the problem was that these notifications are flowing to just Apple platform and it's quite easy to just listen to them. Uh, but for Web3, I mean, it doesn't make sense if notifications are only coming to our apps because again, that's not the Web3 ideology. So what we did was we abstracted the sending part and the receiving part of the notification. So in essence, what a smart contract uh, uh, on this Ethereum layer does is, you know, of course, it follows these things, verifies that the user is controlled, uh, the app uh, is sending notification on the app on a behalf and all those things. But yeah, once all those rules are uh, done and verified, the smart contract basically emits that event out which contains the identity of the notification. And that's the sending part uh, for all the services, how to send the notification out. For the receiving part, because it's abstracted, now we have the ways or we have the means to listen to this one single smart contract, get all the standardized notifications, and then essentially transform them in a way that it's supported by either Apple ecosystem or Android ecosystem or even Telegram or, you know, the end goal vision is that, you know, these notifications are supported by popular uh, crypto wallets uh, by themselves. So, yeah, that's essentially what we did uh, to create the notifications uh, protocol. And, you know, that's essentially how the notifications are basically transformed and emitted out. I'm, I'm curious, like, what are the kinds of, because I mean, we like, I think for for Web2, the use cases are pretty, are pretty clear because I mean, we, I mean, we observe those use cases uh, on a daily basis, at least those of us who have notifications turns on. Uh, but uh, I, I wonder if, in Web three, some things are like some things are obvious. And you mentioned this earlier, like your, your like a liquidation, for example. You want me notified of that. But like, what are some other unique use cases that uh, perhaps are not so obvious, or that you envision it would be it where it would be useful to have push notifications, like for the future of of DeFi? Sure. So DeFi is specific. You know, I have a whole list of ideas. But yeah, uh, near liquidation alerts, I already spoke about that. Uh, price alerts, staking rewards, staking rewards, which are about to expire, stablecoin peg slippage, uh, low gas cost, rebalancing, uh, token contract migration, any security update, governance update, any collateral types which are getting launched on the market, any liquidity mining incentives which has been changed or are now available, any yield farming alerts, uh, any escrow period which is ending, and you know a lot more. In essence, that's that's the thing. That's the beauty of a, a communication protocol. It doesn't just stop over here. I mean, because uh, 
the way the notifications are made, it can be used for any communication that a service wants to do to their users. And by the way, I didn't really uh, spoke about uh, one other innovation which we did, and that's where uh, we are also called the DeFi protocol. We essentially also enabled passive warning for all the users uh, who are receiving notifications. And that essentially relies on the DeFi aspect of our protocol. But yeah, that's another question. I just wanted to highlight that. Just to um, so I can get my head around this fully, it's what this protocol, it's not necessarily a web, like a blockchain specific thing where it's only, you know, dApps can like send notifications. It's really more of saying, hey, there's this like very centralized middleware in the notification stack, which is like owned by Apple. And that's like this like point centralized point of failure or whatever. And then let's decentralize that middleware. The fact that it can be used for like by dApps is like a side thing because it can also be used by like, you know, normal Web2 companies should also choose to use this instead of Apple's middleware. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, uh, uh, that's one of the key points uh, when we were building this. We wanted this to be backward compatible as well as future compatible. So DAP and smart contracts, of course, they cannot send notifications out using uh, traditional means. But Mm -hmm. with uh, EPNS, uh, traditional servers can also send notification out as long as they're following the rules of the protocol. But yeah, just to correct uh, you guys, basically we are building the Web3 uh, decentralized middleware, uh, which will send notifications out and, you know, MetaMask, uh, if, for example, integrates us, it can pop open. Though, guys, MetaMask hasn't integrated us uh, right now. If we have to go to the Apple uh, service or when we go to the Apple ecosystem, I mean, through this Web3 uh, middleware, all the notifications still have to flow through the Apple ecosystem uh, right. because, you know, that's their rules. But mm-hmm. yes, other than that, uh, you're almost, uh, I mean, you're uh, 100% right. Okay, got it. And, and so what's nice is that because this middleware exists on the blockchain, dApps can, al- along with servers sending a transaction to like send a notification, a dApp can also send a tra- create a notification by like sending a smart contract call to the uh, contract. Exactly. Yes. Got it. Okay. That may, okay. Now I think I'm starting to understand it. Wouldn't this cause like a much higher gas overhead for most of these contracts? Like, you know, you, wouldn't we prefer, instead of doing like smart contract calls, wouldn't we prefer to have some architecture where you can use like Ethereum events, for example, which are much cheaper gas wise? than doing smart contract calls? Sure. So actually, if uh, you're looking at the smart contracts calls, uh, in the end, they are emitting an event out. And right. it's uh, it's only because, you know, you said it right, events are cheaper. So right now, even using the smart contract call the way we have made it, it just costs 29,000 gas, uh, which mm-hmm. in essence is not uh, that high. But yeah, uh, there are certain ways by which we are trying to even subvert that. And uh, the way our thesis is, or the way we think is that, you know, in the future, we are going to come into L2 layers. We are exploring solution about that. And, you know, if a traditional server or if a DAP wants to interact uh, with the L2 layers, they can still send a notification. And we will still be on L1, uh, mostly for the mainnet smart contract to our EPNS protocol interaction. And usually whoever are on the mainnet, whatever smart contracts are on the mainnet and they want to send notification, their usual average uh, cost is much, much higher. I mean, um, usually it costs $60. I mean, a couple of days back to uh, basically loan or borrow on RV, V1. And, you know, if notifications were enabled on that platform, it would have cost $60.5 to the user or even less. So the way we think is that, you know, if a user is able to pay $60, then, of course, they will not mind paying 0.1% extra to make sure that Mm -hmm. those notifications uh, make it out to them. 
and of course for the DAP and uh, uh, for these traditional servers, they can continue interacting with us on the L2 layer, uh, thereby solving the problem of the gas price. And of and course, so now, I'm discounting EIP 1559 at, at two. So how does the integration work here now? So your smart contract is basically emitting the events for the notifications. Is it now on each wallet to individually know to subscribe to these events and, and send their own push notifications to the users? Yes. So basically, again, uh, if you compare the Web2 world, services decide what notifications they want to send for the user, as long as the user has opted in to receive notification once. And that's the same uh, architecture which we use on the protocol. So mm -hmm. the user basically has to subscribe to a service or become their subscriber. And we call services channel on our protocol. So mm -hmm. once a channel has a subscriber, after that, the logic of sending notifications, whether they want to trigger on-chain notifications or off-chain notifications, it's left up to them uh, what they want uh, or what they think is useful for the users, either as a whole or a subset or even just one. It's uh, That logic is left up to them and they are free to decide. How do they do the off-chain notification? So I'm understanding the on-chain. So the flow would be that the DAP triggers your contract, emits an event, my wallet on my phone is watching this contract's events. It sees one that was meant for me and it pops up as a notification on my thing. How do you do an off-chain one? Because if my wallet only knows to look at the events of that contract. Sure, so the off-chain can interact uh, with our contract, right? So in the end, uh, as an off-chain service, you are interacting with the protocol. Oh, but you still have to send a transaction on-chain as well. Yeah. Okay, that's what you meant, sorry, okay. The origination of the con of the notification is off chain, but eventually your transaction still has to be made on chain. How expensive do you do you think this is like going to be feasible that every time like a someone wants to send a no notification they have to do an on chain transaction? So like you know you just mentioned that you guys are looking into like L two solutions and like stuff, but like do you not think that this will be like you know especially even in the bootstrapping phase right now, while you're still in V1, right now, Ethereum gas prices are like, you know, it's like a minimum couple of bucks to make a transaction. Do you think that's going to be a hindrance to your getting started? Not really. So, I mean, we already started our alpha product on drop scene and we are going mm -hmm. to come on L2 very, very soon. But yeah, uh, that's, that's the thing. I mean, uh, for now, uh, loan liquidation, uh, I mean, if uh, you have taken a loan of uh, $1,000, you wouldn't mind paying $2. And even at this moment, I mean, with the current gas price uh, we calculated, with 300 gas price, the notification uh, cost uh, come, came around to be uh, one one point two dollars if you were on mainnet. But yeah, with drops in, of course, uh, that's all, uh, totally omitted out. But yeah. You have to imagine uh, or you have to bring L2 into the mix because, you know, of course, we are on Ethereum push notification service. So Ethereum is in our name, but eventually we'll become blockchain agnostic as well. And uh, the way we are doing it is that, you know, we get this middleware running. We, of course, DeFi is the one that needs notification the most. I mean, your finances, if you take a loan from your bank and the bank doesn't foreclose your house before sending you alerts. And, you know, <laughs> this happens in DeFi all along. But yeah, uh, with L2, this becomes a no-brainer uh, no because, again, if L2 is enabled to scale credit, then, of course, you know, L2 will easily be able to scale our notifications. For the cost on L2, I mean, the analysis we have done right now and still ongoing, uh, we feel that it will probably be around uh, $0.001 sending a notification out. And again, a notification transaction uh, doesn't mean that, you know, if you are sending notifications to 20,000 subscribers, uh, then you have to send 20,000 transactions. As I said, you know, the notification identity basically carries uh, a lot of things, among which... Uh, now, uh, what all recipients or subset of recipients or single recipient the notification is meant to. So, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, not really worried about uh, gas costs right now, but mm -hmm. yeah, definitely something we are keeping a close eye on. I think most of the Ethereum 
<laughs> is. So I'd like to talk about uh, channels a little bit and just kind of dive into those. So we've talked a little bit about them, but I, I mean, so if, if you go on the uh, EPNS um, app, so like I installed the app on my phone, I got it set up and everything. And like, there is some channels here that I can subscribe to. Uh, so there is a, like a Bitcoin price channel. I, I don't have them in front of me right now, but like I was looking at it earlier. And so there's like some kind of generic uh, channels there. Now, next next to each channel, there is like a number of users, presumably, that are subscribed to that channel and also a cost in DAI. Um, so walk us through then. So like what are channels conceptually? So is it is it a stream of information that is going to you know, different users like a, like a Telegram group or or this each? So for something that's a little bit more personal, like, for example, a loan liquidation, is that on a, on a sort of user or individual address? Or is it like one channel where that channel is sending information to multiple users in this case? Like how is that structured? And then later we can get into the um, like the economics of how this works. Channels, basically, they're very much similar to YouTube. So any user or any service, when they want to send a notification, they have to become a channel. And uh, that channel then basically have subscribers. So the subscribers are basically opting in to receive notification from that channel. The way we have designed it was, uh, we thought a lot about it that, you know, Aave or Compound or any other DeFi protocol will come and start using notifications through channels. But what if uh, some uh, DeFi enabling uh, apps like Zappify or Instadapp, they also come in and now they are sending notifications uh, that also uh, contains Aave as a subset. And because of that, you know, we realized that uh, having a channel for each specific service makes a lot of sense. And that's what the channel does. Uh, the 50 or the number, the amount in coins which you saw in the app, uh, that basically is the part of the incentivized uh, notification flow which I uh, spoke about it uh, a bit briefly. But essentially, uh, it's also a stable mechanism feature. So we are a decentralized protocol. That means we don't have a centralized flow. We cannot verify if a channel is good or bad. And we cannot even verify if a channel is what. So uh, what we do is uh, we ask channels who are interested to send notifications to first activate themselves on our protocol. And the way we do it is we tell them that, you know, you have to stake uh, uh, some amount of DAI for your channel to be active. The some amount of DAI is either 50 DAI or it can go as high as the channel wants. And I'll get into the reason why it is dynamic in a bit. But yeah, once the channel activates themselves, that means they have deposited these DAI. We then use this DAI or we then take this DAI and we lend it out to our platform. And in turn, of course, we start generating interest on uh, those time. And yeah, whenever a subscriber, uh, subscriber or a user comes in and says, hey, I want notification from this specific service, that user automatically becomes eligible to receive a part of this interest. So that is one way by which uh, we try to incentivize these notifications for the user. And of course, you know, ensure that the civil mechanism on the protocol is also there. So what, what, just one question here. What is the purpose of incentivizing users to receive notifications? I mean, I, I receive notifications and the incentive is the information itself because it's useful to me. It's valuable to me in a context. Why do I need extra incentive, financial incentive to receive a notification? I can say why not. But uh, uh, basically, uh, the reason is that, you know, if you're a Uniswap or if you're Aave, if you're a compound, of course, you know, user wants to receive these notifications. But yeah, let's say you are running a promotion. At that point of time, you can deposit a higher stake, which will transform into more uh, passive earnings for your users. So it can also be a user engagement and it can also be a way to drive more users to your protocol. Or if you have launched a new protocol and you just want eyes on that protocol, so again, the incentive part works very well because, you know, the users are flowing in onto the protocol. Yeah, I'm still not fully seeing it. Like, you know, I could have, you could have built a separate protocol to allow dApps to pay their users, but it doesn't seem, it just doesn't make sense to me why it's, this is 
linked in with a notification system? Sure. I mean, uh, the first thing is Sybil. And that's why we kept the uh, staking fee quite low. This is refundable. So a service, uh, when they don't want to send notification, they can take uh, the staking fee out. So the first thing to keep in mind is that first and foremost, this is a simple mechanism. And then, you know, once we build it, we realize that there's a DeFi aspect to it. We can generate passive earnings for the users. So why not go ahead and do that? Wait, so what's the Sybil attack here? What would a service be able to do by Sybiling? Sure. So one of the things a person can do is uh, a person can basically create 10,000 of the channels by just mm-hmm. creating 10,000 wallets and then just uh, transacting with those wallets. And, you know, uh, if the transaction fee is cheap, especially on the L2 network and even on the L1 network, uh, the transaction fee is quite cheap to activate a channel. Then, yeah, it basically becomes transaction upon transactions that can be done or executed at a very cheap cost. So with the uh, with this mechanism that you have to deposit fifty dai or higher, uh, we are essentially telling uh, players that you know if you are say, uh, serious about sending notifications, then this fifty dai or higher doesn't really affect you. Why does it matter if someone creates a hundred channels if the if the users don't subscribe to them? Why would it matter? I mean, uh, uh, in a way, our app is also discovering these channels. And uh, at that point of time, it really made sense. And with the incentivized earning and the flow, I mean, not a lot of users have really complained about it. In fact, they're happy about it. So it kind of really worked out. Hmm. But also like the idea of like, you know, if the minimum is 50 die, putting that on Ave, that's not going to really get that much yield, right? It's going to get like a couple of bucks a year split over thousands of users. Wasn't the, I feel like the complexity of this entire system of like lending on Ave is just like not even worth it. And plus there is definitely additional gas costs that do that come with like doing this whole Ave system. Won't that just like cancel out all the yields if it's only $50? Yeah, so that's the thing. I mean, for Uniswap, the user already sees the uh, benefit of the notification. So they just have to do 50 die. If you look at it from a pro- promotional perspective, uh, let's say a protocol is newly launched and they just want users to know about their protocol. And, you know, if they deposit 10,000 die on their channel, then all of a sudden uh, there will be an influx of users. Even if it's for a weekend, you know, after that, they reduce it to 50 day. So it's more like a promotional or an incentivized mechanism. Uh, for the users, it's uh, more like uh, uh, more of a passive earning rather than an active earning. So think of it more like, you know, in a promotional sense and think of it that if a user is spending some gas cost to opt in or subscribe to a channel, then, you know, if the information is worthwhile for them, then yeah, this kind of makes up for it in the long run. It's unclear to me here, like who is the target uh, user for this product? Is it you know is it end users? So you you could look at it one as one way. It was like okay, an end user could see value in this because they're going to be notified like when there's a liquidation coming or when their domain name expires, and like that's a clear value for the user who wants to be informed of that of that information of that fact. And, but on the other hand, like this incentive mechanism, this kind of almost like promotional, almost like kind of, I mean, it it does seem like a little bit spammy. Like, you know, it feels like you just have, you know, you just have like a bunch of people in there, the same people that you'd have in these, you know, kind of like pumpy telegram groups or whatever, like trying to pump, you know, coins that the projects would have created notifications for, like, I don't know. I guess I don't know like who the user, the final user is meant to be. And also this, this whole promotion mechanism just seems a bit off to me. And I don't know like why anyone would, would want to go in there if the interest that they're due to receive is like 50 euros worth of die, you know, like on, on Ave. Sure. I mean, um, there are a couple of ways to look at it. First of all, uh, Again, if the service is attractive enough, uh, then the user, of course, wants notification and they don't really have to care about incentives. 
So yeah, that's that's one way to look at it. The second way to look at it is, you know, if the service is gaining popularity or if they are running promotions, then it uh, does make sense for a lot of users who are not based on the Western part of the country. Because, you know, while earning two die or three die or four die in a month might not be a lot of good passive earnings uh, for the users uh, in uh, uh, developed countries. But for the users who are uh, in non-developed countries, it's a way to drive mechanism. It's the same way how, uh, you know, promotions are run, run or, you know, uh, why does it make sense to uh, encourage liquidity mining? Uh, it makes sense because, you know, you can drive growth to your platform. And with this way, I mean, we just provided yeah, a way. So, but is that like sustainable growth, though? Because if like if you're talking about, okay, I, I kind of get that these incentive mechanisms or these promotions or, or like this this passive income is useful for you know, for people uh, who, who don't have like a high level of income, but, you know, for the platforms on the other side who are like buying, buying this attention, uh, is that really, you know, who they're targeting as, as users? And is that really like sustainable growth for them? If the protocol, like if, if they just have like a bunch of people in there that are just like trying to get passive income, but don't really care about the protocol, it's just like, oh, uh, here's an opportunity for me like, to make like two or three bucks a day. Yeah, wouldn't also people just like subscribe to every possible channel just so they can get the yield from all of them? Yeah, actually, nice question. But here, here is uh, the argument that makes sense because, you know, people who are subscribing to these channels, they are earning a uh, very small passive income that is getting better over time. So yeah, users can, of course, go ahead and subscribe to all the channels. But in essence, uh, you know, most of the time, users will probably subscribe to channels uh, who they really like or you know where the incentivization structure is quite high and again that's that's a thing i mean for us being a uh, decentralized or being a communication middleware we have just left these rules uh, open for any services to come and try because you know uh, users indicated that they wanted this or service indicated that they wanted but at the same time, we made it quite flexible so that uh, services, they, if they think that, you know, incentivized notification is not something which their game theory supports, then they can just take 50 die and that's not going to generate a lot of funding for these users. So in essence, they can play by their own game theory and their own rules. We are not uh, going to force anyone to pay high or low just on that fact. So yeah, that's, that's the thing. One of the other things you mentioned, you know, is that it's meant to compensate the users for the gas costs of like subscribing. Why do I have to make an on-chain transaction to subscribe? That seems kind of unnecessary. I feel like there what there's some easy ways to design a way to subscribe to channels off-chain by just sending a message or something. Why why do I have to subscribe on-chain? We are going to bring meta transactions into that mix. Uh, so yeah, uh, the services can also offload that cost if they want for their users. But yeah, mm -hmm. on-chain uh, is needed because, again, uh, this is a decentralized communication middleware and we need to make sure that the user has opted in or the user wallet has opted in to get notifications from a channel before those notifications can flow through the smart contract or can flow through the service. So that's why that on-chain event is needed. You know, whether it's done on the L2 smart contract of ours or on L1 or through meta transaction, that's something which uh, we are actively, you know, trying to build. Yeah, it's, I mean, it seems to me like this could also, I'm probably far less technically positioned to answer this, but like, it seems that you could post the, post the notifications to IPFS. Some, if, if they're meant for everyone, like anyone can just kind of pull that data from IPFS directly. And then, so therefore you don't need the on-chain transaction. And if it's uh, sort of data that's meant for a specific user, that data could maybe be encrypted using some kind of handshake mechanism that leverages the user's existing um, uh, private key. And then they would not like, so it would also be there on IPFS, but only they would have access to it. And then, then maybe that would not 
necessitate that on-chain transaction. I don't know, Sunny, does that make sense uh, from a technical perspective? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you, you could do something similar. You need a way for the wallets to find out about the IPFS data, but like, I think that there's ways of... I, I was just talking about just specifically for subscribing. For the IPFS, uh, it will uh, not work. I mean, uh, the only way it will work is if uh, IPNS is somehow connected to IPFS uh, and those IPFS, uh, IPFS files are getting pinned down. And again, uh, for the DAP and smart contract, that will not work because how okay. will they interact with the IPFS? So that is, uh, that is why uh, on-chain uh, transactions are needed because, you know, again, uh, these are user wallets that are uh, uh, saying that uh, I allow a service to uh, receive a notification and uh, i mean till till now whatever uh, uh, we have done and again that's that's something which we al- always feel that the protocol should be ever evolving but mm-hmm. till now uh, and the ways which we have identified is if the user subscribe to it then you know the middleware works and follows the rule if the meta transaction is executed on behalf of the user even then uh, that really works but Till now, we haven't really found a way to, you know, make sure that uh, we are verifying these users and uh, uh, getting uh, things on chain or, you know, and getting things somewhere that can be verified that, you know, uh, users have done it. So one way is by uh, making the users sign uh, their consent. But then again, we have to send it to the smart contract in one way or the other. Because, you know, if you are using IPFS, again, the DAP and the smart contract link, it gets jeopardized. So could you tell us now a little bit about, you know, you mentioned the spam scoring that you guys have to filter channels and stuff. How, do, how does that work? So that was the middle part, uh, you know, when the user has opted in to receive notifications from a service. After that, what if a service turns malicious or, you know, a service turns evil? or the service is sold to someone, or, you know, they are hacked. And at that point of time, we started thinking that, you know, how to protect these users, because, you know, at that point of time, a lot of spam can come their way. And uh, that's when we uh, designed the spam score. And we are still working on it. I mean, that's one of the last feature, which is getting worked on uh, on the protocol to become a version one for the mainnet launch. But yeah. In essence, the spam score uh, uh, essentially will measure uh, the channel positive signals as well as the channel's negative signals. And based on that, it will assign a score uh, to a channel between a score of 0 and 1. When I say negative signals, uh, they can be higher than usual unsubscribe rate. They can be sending a lot more notifications than you know the service is sending. When I talk about positive uh, signals, they can be higher than usual subscribe rates or a passage of time getting passed by. So yeah, uh, and we are still uh, working on uh, more uh, positive and negative factors. But in essence, they will transform uh, a channel score between zero and one. Zero being that the channel is really healthy and one being that the channel is really bad or you know the channel is spammy. At one point of time, if the spam score comes to, let's say, 0.8, the protocol or the smart contract will itself start to throttle uh, the number of notifications a channel can send. And basically, with passage of time, the spam score will decrease bit by bit or, you know, with the subscribe rate or, you know, positive events. But if the channel continues to do that, then, you know, that 0.8 score will go to 0.9 or even 1. And then it becomes uh, a lot tougher for the channel to send notification out until they are back into the healthy range. Mm. So that's yeah. that's the spam score. I'm curious about the spam score and the like, is is it meant to be just sort of an indicator for people subscribing to the channel to see okay this is a channel that is healthy based on these indicators so therefore I know I'm going into something where I'm going to get you know actually good information. Or is it, so I guess there's so this, this throttling, I guess I don't really understand the point if I'm subscribing to a channel, I can just unsubscribe, if something's spammy, I just, I just get out of it. And I really don't care what the spam score is. It's my experience that kind of makes the difference. Yeah, how does that, like, how do you think about that? 
yeah, you can go ahead and unsubscribe and the channel cannot add you back. But yeah, uh, what we thought was, uh, of course, you know, that spam score also acts as an indicator that how good a channel is. But yeah, of course, you know, for the users uh, or for the hack channels or for the comp compromise channels, uh, this is spam score throttling basically gives us a way or basically gives them a way to kind of correct their behavior. And if they don't, uh, then, you know, even if you're subscribed or, you know, even if you don't want to or are reluctant to unsubscribe, even then these notifications will stop coming your way, making, you know, the entire ecosystem a little uh, uh, less uh, spammy. But yeah, you can definitely go and unsubscribe. These criteria that you've established for um, for the spam in, uh, index, I mean, do, do you see a possibility where, like, for example, something that might seem undesirable could actually be something that you just want and could have negative effects on the spam score? So let's say, for example, you know, hypothetically, like, I want a notification system that sends me something like every minute. Like I want some really up-to-date information and maybe I'm not reading it directly, but maybe it's feeding into some other system, right? That's treating the information. Now that might be useful in my use case, but in terms of the spam score, like that might be rated as a, like a, a low spam score or a high spam score, whatever, however you're counting it. How, how would one mitigate that? Is, is, is there a way to kind of like inform the system? Like, okay, this is what I'm doing. And like, this is a valid channel and so therefore like i can I, I should send one message per minute so there are the, and again uh this is an ever-evolving feature uh but yeah there are two ways by which uh, uh we are trying to approach that solution uh one way is again you as a user if you are indicating that uh, so we are building uh a user specific uh structure a user specific setting within the channel itself so if you uh, if you are opting into that, we might be able to you know uh, uh, forego the spam throttle and you know we make the notification go ahead. And the second way which uh, we have just started exploring is through a social verifying badge or the verifying badge. So when we start the service uh, on the mainnet, we are going to give uh, the channels who we have verified just a badge or just a flag. And then these services can also give that flag to channels who they think are uh, right or who they think are official. And basically, if that flag is present, uh, uh, whether it's our flag or the services who have uh, given uh, other services the flag, then basically we might take the spam control formula in a little less way. So again, this is something uh, or this formula is something which uh, we are still actively developing because, yeah, the way you have sent, you know, what if a user wants to receive these notifications that has to uh, make that has to make their way. Now, one of our uh, investors actually told us uh, about a different use case, which was what if I just subscribe to a channel 10,000 times because I'm a rival of that channel and then unsubscribe all at once. And that will give me so much of a negative store that I'm killing off competition. And we realized that, you know, this is something which we still need to work on to make sure that this doesn't happen. So, yeah, we are still working on that formula. But these are the ways uh, uh, which we have identified so far uh, to make sure that the spam score works. Just off the top of my, my head, I, I think what you might want is some sort of web of trust thing where you can see what channels your friends are subscribed to and then uh, go build go based off of something like that rather than like because you because a web, web of trust basically help you determine the difference between some random address subscribed to channels versus like you know my tr trustworthy people relative to me subscribed to certain channels and that's then, really an awesome idea i'm going yeah. to include that um and then so then the last thing i want we wanted to talk about is i guess is maybe two things actually then one one is how do you plan on onboarding and incentivizing wallets to integrate. Like, you know, what you really need is like, this will only become su successful once you have like MetaMask and Argent and ev everyone be uh, subscribed to this. But then part of the problem is that some of these wallets, um, 
you know, their DeFi integrations are their like key selling feature. And so how do you convince them to like drop that and like join this open protocol? That's actually a very, very tricky and a very awesome question. Uh, we asked this question a lot. Uh, I mean, one thing was there that, you know, we can follow the story of Bitcoin and Ethereum that uh, with enough uh, network effect, people are bound to uh, just integrate. But then we realize that, you know, this is an open protocol. Uh, eventually, uh, we are going to introduce a fee feature uh, for services that are sending notification. What we are going to do is this fee will flow directly from the protocol. So what we have come up is a win-win uh, scenario for both the crypto wallets that integrate the protocol and for the users or our token holders. Uh, what in essence we are doing in along with the network effect is that we are telling uh, these crypto wallets that, hey, if you integrate us uh, and if you move a proposal and that proposal is passed through the token holders, then you will get a, a, then you will get a fee split of whatever revenue the protocol earns. Uh, and that thing is completely decentralized. It's completely uh, built on governance. So in essence, what we are doing or the way we are approaching it is that let's say MetaMask uh, wants to integrate uh, to our protocol. Uh, then they integrate uh, the protocol and then they can move a uh, governance uh, uh, feature or governance proposal on our protocol that, hey, we are bringing 1 million users to the protocol. And that means we should get 70% of the fee that is getting generated by the smart contract or uh, the protocol. And if that proposal passes, then uh, perpetually MetaMask will be able to claim 70% of the fee that is getting earned from the protocol. Uh, the way we see this entire network effect to take place is uh, A, getting uh, services to our protocol. And uh, uh, there are three ways by which we are doing that. Of course, we are going uh, to all the services and we are talking and telling them about the advantage of push notifications and now you can send it. And we want official notifications to come. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, one thing which we are doing. The second thing we are doing is we are creating our own channels. Uh, like what uh, Sebastian just said, we have created our channels like BTC Tracker, Ad Tracker, uh, Ad Gas. Uh, even our wallet tracker is coming very, very soon. That will send notifications out for certain activities, whether that's on-chain activities in terms of wallet tracker or off-chain in terms of Ad Gas. Uh, that will start to drive the user and see uh, we are going to offer uh, liquidity mining or usage mining to all the third-party developers who can come and build on our protocol. Uh, and in essence, if they are able to bring valid subscribers uh, into the channel, they will start getting our push tokens. Those are governance tokens. So what we feel is that these three things will eventually drive users to the protocol. Uh, which essentially will drive uh, at first uh, smaller services and then higher uh, or you know top tier services to the protocol, which in turn will uh, enable revenue generation of short sorts that will start to happen on protocol. And at that point of time, you know crypto wallets, uh, uh, especially the ones who are suffering from monetization, they will be incentivized to come and integrate our protocol and start showing notification and start taking a share of the kitty. And, you know, this uh, cycle will be rinsed and repeated uh, every few times as and when we grow to make sure that, you know, the network effect is kind of uh, catalyzed. The last piece was, you know, the, the push token that you guys have, you know, in the white paper, it kind of, you open the dock and it frees like a, legal document or something with all these disclaimers. And honestly, after reading it, I didn't quite fully understand what the push token is doing. So could you maybe clarify a bit about that? And those legal disclaimers are because of our lawyers. <laughs> the first <laughs> version was very, very simple. In essence, push tokens are governance tokens. So uh, what they do is they enable or they allow uh, the token holds, holders to control or the core features of the protocol. So some of the things like we discussed, spam throttle uh, or the fee which we'll charge, what fee we'll charge in the future and other core features of the protocol. 
the other thing which push tokens also do is uh, enables uh, governance proposals to be passed uh, which enables fee split for the crypto wallets and the third thing the push token does is because you know everything is relied on these token holders they are also eligible to take a part of this fee that is getting generated on the protocol to them so yeah and yeah the last thing i missed out was the liquidity mining or the usage mining so the way we have designed these tokens is we also want to uh, make sure uh, that we attract third party developers as well as active users and you know staking users into our ecosystem and for uh, for those things push tokens are also useful because you know if you are a developer and you are building a channel on our protocol and that and drives in valid users then you will earn a share of those push tokens going forward same for uh, active subscriber if you are active on our ecosystem and uh, in essence you are not a bot then you will also start getting push tokens at a variable rate you know once we hit mainnet so in essence that is what the push tokens uh, do for our protocol so where can people go to find you and um how can people learn more about uh, building on uh, on the protocol? So yes uh, people can visit uh, epns.io and you know that's our website uh, they can uh, find us over there but yeah in case they want to uh, chat about us or you know brainstorm with us for the features uh, they should join our telegram group which is epns project uh, on telegram or on twitter with the same handle and uh, for all the people who want to try the app out just visit app.epns.io or you know visit the website and you know you can just uh, navigate your way from there great thanks harsh thanks sebastian and thanks sunny uh, it was great to be here and uh, you know i kind of picked up a new feature for the protocol <laughs> yeah <Yay, laughs> great. Yeah, great thanks Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guest, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.